Hey, Susan. Hi, Jason. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for uh, making some time in your schedule to, to chat with me. And, and uh, I see you're at your home office. <laughs> yes, as so many of us are these days. This used to be a guest room, and now it's where I spend many hours a day. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> ditto. Now I'm in my studio. Used to be a guest room. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have guests anymore, so it worked out fine. <laughs> So uh, we've never chatted before. We've never met. Uh, for the listeners, can you can you share who you are and 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 where you're located? What museum you're affiliated with? Sure. I'm Susan Evans McClure. I'm the executive director at Lake Champlain Maritime Museum, and we are uh, just outside of Vergennes, Vermont, right on the shores of Lake Champlain, in on the Vermont side of the lake. And how how long have you been with 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 them? Uh, I have been there for just about two, a little over two years. So I got to have the first year of working in a new place and trying to get my feet under me. And then the second year of managing a museum through a global pandemic. So I'm in year three, figure it's yeah. gotta, gotta get more stable from here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, what is the, is, is there any difference between like honeymoon periods for maritime museums versus other museums? I mean, was it about three, four years? <laughs> I, you know, I think uh, I, it's probably different at many locations. Um, yeah. I, our museum is going through a lot of change right now. We're just about 35, 36 years old. Wow. So there is enough new things happening and enough different ways of working that hopefully I won't, the plan is to not get bored for a while um, because we have an amazing, amazing team and amazing collections and there's, there's lots of work to do. Yeah. I was looking on your website. The staff looks really cool. And was there uh, you, you had filled in uh, for someone, a long, long standing director that had been there a long time, right? Yeah. We've um, you know, when you, I've stepped into a really great organization and people love it so much that they've been there for their entire careers. So, wow. uh, yeah. yeah, the person I, um, took over for had been there. It's the only job he'd ever had. <laughs> and so he started working there when he, I think it was 18 or 19 years old. Wow. Um, and he, he wanted a time for a change. So it was a great opportunity for me to step in. Yeah. That's great that, um, that you've landed there and it, it's such a cool organization. What, what, uh, have, did you have you always had an interest in museums and history? Yeah. Or how far so, back does that go? <laughs> um, so I actually, yes, I you know was always a nerdy little kid who loved going to museums, huh. as so many grown-up museum professionals are. That's how we started out. Uh, and I actually majored in history and theater, and I went to undergrad at McGill University in Montreal. And I'm American, so I was actually looking for a summer job in Vermont, because we're very close, we're a border state. Montreal is like 90 minutes from Burlington, Vermont. So I was looking for a summer job and I applied to a bunch of places that I thought were hiring tour guides because I figured I was a theater major. And one of those places was Shelburne Museum. And okay. I emailed them and said, emailed the education director like blind, cold email and said, hi, I'm a theater major and I'm a history major and here's what I wanna do. Are you hiring tour guides? And she said, no, but we are hiring our summer education staff. Have you ever done that before? Mm. And I had like worked at summer camps and done, you know, art making stuff. So kind of got an impromptu job offer there and didn't really realize that working in museums was a career path. Mm. <laughs> and I had never even considered it uh, until I worked in a museum and really loved it. Yeah. So um, that must have been a, a busy job. I mean, with their visitorship and and just um yeah i've never been there but i've heard amazing things about about shelburne yeah it's a great place they as an organization they have a lot of history they have amazing collections um and they got an international well in non-covid years an international audience base to come to vermont just to see the museum yeah yeah and uh i saw online you were at the smithsonian for for a little while i was so i have taken kind of a um I think sometimes when people ask about like, how did you get to be a museum director? They expect a linear story. Right. That was not my case. I actually worked in museums and then um, ended up working at a brewery for several years in Vermont and worked in beer and beer marketing for years. And then kind of realized maybe I don't want to do that for the rest of my life. <laughs> so yeah. made my way back to museums uh, after going to graduate school and ended up at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History. 
And I started there managing the educational theater programs. Uh, and then from that went into leading our food history programs team, which is oh. a really great opportunity to start a program uh, based on some really longstanding collections and curatorial work. Yeah. So we, yeah. We Did you work on, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Did you work on any of the um, sites, uh, food ways exhibits that went out from the Smithsonian? Mm -hmm. So we, uh, I was more on the program development side. So oh, okay. I knew, knew that team well and talked to them oh. a lot, but, um, okay. and it was great that they have a touring arm of the Smithsonian bringing the, bringing Smithsonian collections and exhibits out to the rest of the country. Yeah, yeah. So you were involved in developing the, the programming and the educational side of those things? Yeah, around our food history work. So of course, Julia Child's Kitchen is at the Smithsonian, but there's also large collections of agriculture history and um, foodways work and industry around food. So we actually opened a demonstration kitchen in the museum. It was the first demonstration kitchen on the mm. National Mall wow. <laughs> uh, where we did cooking demonstrations as a way to connect people to um, start thinking about, you know, how we eat, what we eat, how it's grown and how that all helps us understand American identity. It's a really fun project. <laughs> and yeah. from there, I went on to uh, become the director of programs and audience development for the whole museum. So working with the food history programs, but also our jazz orchestra and um, social media, digital outreach and all sorts of other angles of how do we, thinking about how do we get more people to engage in um, history with museums. And to do that at that scale must have been pretty challenging. Yes. <laughs> no, but it was great. We had an amazingly, yeah, a lot of opportunities. You know, it's people answer your phone calls when you call and say, I'm from the Smithsonian. They always pick up. It was very nice. Um, yeah. And I got an opportunity to work with really amazingly talented people around the world and oh. come up with some really interesting projects. Um, I kind of have a, it, I think it takes a lot for um, me to not share an idea. <laughs> so I often was the one who would share kind of crazy ideas and be like, yeah, let's do it. Let's figure out a way to do it. And got to do some really fun things that way. <laughs> so then so then you begin weaving your way back up to New England. Yeah, uh, my okay. husband is from Vermont. We love Vermont. We met here. We always wanted to come back. So we were trying to figure out a way to do that. Um, and I actually uh, took a job as the director of an organization called Inclusive Arts Vermont that does um, um, arts, e arts and accessibility education throughout the state. Okay. So got to work with some amazing folks in Vermont's disability community and arts education community and loved working there and was planning to stay for a long time. <laughs> but yeah. this opportunity at Lake Champlain Maritime Museum opened up in the end of 2018. And um, there's some fun overlaps with my personal experience. Uh, when I was at the Smithsonian, I did a big project on Benedict Arnold and the gunboat Philadelphia. Hmm. The gunboat Philadelphia was actually taken out of Lake Champlain in the 30s and then eventually made its way to the Smithsonian. So it's on display at the Smithsonian. Hmm. And I spent about a year researching that boat and the story and the Battle of Valcour Bay on Lake Champlain and talking to the public about it. Wow. So when this opportunity, Lake Champlain Maritime Museum has also studied the obviously the Revolutionary War history on Lake Champlain for a long time. And when this opportunity opened up, there was, you know, I, I like to say that it kind of in the Venn diagram of like people who know like a ridiculous amount about the Battle of Valcour Bay and Lake Champlain, <laughs> people who live in Vermont and people who have museum experience, there's like one tiny yeah. person in the middle. So right. it was a great place to land. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um I hope we can get into we can get into it now, or you know maybe we got to think about it a little bit more. But like I'm really fascinated. I've always thought that museums could bring some of the techniques and thoughts and just some of the the experiences of theater in in the museum space. And um, I just I just always thought that was a really like a golden opportunity especially for historic sites or maybe any museum that's doing a, a reenactment or, or some sort of historical program. I just think theater could be a real, the knowledge of how theater works would be a real um, asset. Yeah, thanks. I think so too. Yeah. <laughs> and actually there's a great organization. I used to be on the board of an organization called the International Museum Theater Alliance that does just this kind of thing around the world, actually. Um, there's wow. chapters in 
most continents, most at least Europe and there's an Asian chapter. Anyway, there it's a global organization. Um, and it really is about that, about taking some of the concepts of theater and understanding how they work in education and in the museum space. Huh. I um, used to teach a class on museum theater and I think that um, museums are performance spaces. We don't always think of ourselves that way, but it has all the elements, right? Like you have audience members who are coming in, you're putting something on display. <laughs> sometimes there's someone talking at you, sometimes you're doing something. So it has all the same elements of a theatrical experience. Mm. And I think when museums think of themselves that way, they actually switch to being much more audience focused and um, can have better interactions with visitors. Not to mention me, more fun. It's just more fun. Yeah, I think about some of the most engaging experiences I've ever had. I've, I felt like I was, you know, transported to a different time or place or experience. And it was it was done through techniques, you know, the often that you see in theater. And um, at the Smithsonian, I think I experienced that a little bit at, at the, uh, was the lunch counter exhibit. I mean, yeah, that was... were, were there elements of theater in that? I don't know. I, I just don't understand. There it. were actually, that was one of the projects I worked on. Um, so the Greensboro lunch counter was the site of the first student, well, one of the, the beginnings of the student sit-in movement in the 1960s. So there's a piece of that lunch counter on display and uh, a really talented former colleague of mine created a program called, named Chris Wilson, created a program called Join the Student Sit-In that actually took a historic training manual that was used to train people on how to do sit-ins hmm. and turned it into a theatrical experience. So that the audience was um, the the con the conceit was that the audience was attending a training session and they were being led in nonviolent training, and that program I think worked really well and um, is one that I like to think about a lot because the audience had a clearly defined role. I think museum theater and performance in museums gets a bit of a bad rap because we've all had examples of it being truly terrible. Yeah, and really that, cheesy. Yeah, there's like nothing worse than no dig on butter churning, but there's nothing worse than having someone churning butter in costume just talking at you. Like no one wants that. Right. So to me, the most important part of setting up that experience is making sure that as the person creating the educational experience, you know what the role of the audience member is supposed to be and what they're supposed to be doing there. And then you can go from there. Yeah. I feel like people from a, from a visitor's point of view, when I've visited places too, um, it's not that the setting has to be perfect. I mean, because, you know, in a, in a big building, you might not have the perfect backdrop, but it's like you want that authenticity. I mean, you want to be able to kind of feel that. And, and it's hard to put, my, put a word on it, but um, the best experience that I ever had, it's like you can feel that authenticity coming through based on... Uh, primary research, I, I suppose, and really doing your homework. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it has to be based, I mean, that's the history piece, right? It has to be based on what actually happened. Um, yeah. I think one of the um, dangers about historical accuracy is that we can often recreate the problems of history. So you also see examples where, including examples that maritime museums struggle with about replica boats that replica historic ships are in and houses sometimes are not accessible places like that we didn't have an americans with disabilities act when mm. 19th century canal boats were sailing on lake champlain so that's something that i think museums have to be really careful about is that you never i firmly believe you should never sacrifice accessibility for historic authenticity <laughs> that there is it's not real right it's a, it's a museum <laughs> so i think we should always be making some adjustments to that to be making sure that our experiences are accessible to the widest number of people and audiences. Yeah. So um, can you give us a, a, a quick overview of, of some of the main highlights of the, the Maritime Museum and, and what you guys do there? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So we are all about um, preserving and sharing the cultural history of Lake Champlain. So Lake Champlain is located between two states, and two countries, so Canada and the US and New York and Vermont. Uh, and it's been a water, a transportation, uh, central corridor of transportation through back to the earliest, um, the earliest history of people living in the Champlain Valley. Hmm. And the lake itself is now home to many, many, many shipwrecks from all sorts of different eras of history and uh, boats made by indigenous people, boats that were used in 
um, the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, uh, shipping in the 19th century. There's a lot of boats on the bottom of Lake Champlain <laughs> and our mm. team has been studying them since the early 80s. Uh, and our, our while our focus is on shipwrecks and pr protecting that uh, cultural history of the shipwrecks themselves, we also really wanna use that as a springboard to get people thinking about the health of the lake today and how people can be taking action in their own lives to be ensuring the health of the lake for the future. So we have on water programs with students, we have boat building programs, we have rowing programs, we have ecology programs, all sorts of things to get people to make their own connections with the lake in the hope that if you have your own connection with the lake, you're more likely to take care of it in the future. Mm. Yeah, I love that, um, that the mission of stewardship of, of, the, of the waters. And yeah, and that means, I mean, stewardship can mean stewarding a cultural resource to make sure that a shipwreck is still there, but it also can, it means environmental stewardship mm -hmm. and uh, making sure that the lake is still healthy and the ecosystem is healthy. And those two that we're a, we call, we say that we're a history, ecology, and archaeology museum. And those three things can feel different, but they're all totally connected. You can't have one without the other. Is, is, there, a, is there a particular ec ecological problem or major issue that the, the lake is struggling with now? Yeah. I mean, there might be, there could <laughs> um, be like there, a bunch yeah, of them. There's a few. Um, well, you know, I think it's, it, it's no different than any large body of water, right? There, we like to consider it the sixth Great Lake or pretty good lake, um, but it is different than the Great Lakes, but it's, it is connected. Um, we also, you know, we have issues with aquatic invasive species, with um, phosphorus runoff and high levels of pollution from uh, high levels of pollution, mm -hmm. um, which led to cyanobacteria blooms. Uh, we have a growing microplastics problem, mm. microplastics pollution issue in Lake Champlain that people are just kind of understanding. And yeah, the invasive species one is one that is continuing to, that we have amazing people working on both sides of the lake to monitor and try to mitigate any further invasive species from getting here. Is that like the fish that get into ship ships somehow and yeah. they, they get d dumped out in the in the different lakes and yeah there's a bunch of different ones um invasive aquatic invasive species are really things you know anything that lives in the water that is not native to this area yeah. often those things have no natural predators so they end up taking over the ecosystem in which they are now have arrived so a few that um have made their way <laughs> to lake champlain are the spiny water flea uh eurasian milfoil um, zebra mussels, You've, everybody's kind of heard of zebra mussels. Those are yeah. invasive. Uh, and you know, there's, there's unfortunately several more, but we're hoping that there will not be too many more after that. Lake so, Champlain is, oh, go, oh ahead. go ahead, go ahead. I don't, I don't want to interrupt you with that. <laughs> no, talk. that's fine. Um, Lake Champlain is a really connected waterway. If I think if you think about Lake Champlain, it's just like up here in New England, but it's actually, uh, you can get to the Atlantic Ocean from Lake Champlain and you can get to the Hudson River through the canal system. And then through the uh, Champlain Canal, it connects to the Hudson River, and then you can take the Erie Canal to the Great Lake, all of the Great Lakes, or the Hudson River to New York City. Um, so we are, a, you can actually, you know, we're a central waterway that gets you through all of New England. Well, I was going to ask you, is, are there, um, is there a network of maritime museum places that where you guys kind of get together and strategize and talk about issues? There are, there's um, an international maritime museum network and then a US based maritime museum network. Okay. Uh, really great colleagues there. I think all maritime museums, um, the, many of them are different because they are place based generally and it, in relation to the water in some way. Uh, but we do share a challenge that we all have a lot of boats mm. and uh, everything you've ever heard about boats are true. They are, a <laughs> they are challenging, but amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that's a problem that many maritime museums are struggling with right now is how to maintain collections of both historic boats, but then also how to maintain replica boats. Um, hmm. you know, there's, that's an exciting part of visiting a maritime museum is you get to go on a boat. Uh, those boats are really expensive to maintain and take very specialized, um, expertise on the part of the staff. Yeah. So that's something we're um, trying to figure out. But again, we're not, we talk to our maritime museum colleagues. We're not really alone in that. It's just, nobody has a great answer. <laughs> we, um, you, they, um, 
I can imagine that the, just the, the, like the care for, for the, for you have to have the people that know those things too. Right. I mean, is that, that's gotta be a, that craftsmanship, how do you get people interested in, you know, learning it so that, so that the preservation can continue. I know that's something that the, uh, in St. Michael's, the, the Maritime Museum there, you know, that's something they have an active program. But um, is there a, I imagine, is there a mentor, mentee program for learning those types of things or? Yeah, there, there is. Um, so our, one of our signature programs is our Champlain Longboats boat building program. We okay. actually bring 10 to 15 kids to the museum every year to build a boat together. And then those boats are used in a middle and high school rowing league for about 150 kids in the spring and the fall. So the students get to build the boat, but then they also get to see them in use, which I think is a really exciting part of the project. That program is not, not necessarily about, you learn boat building skills, but it's often we often call it life skills through boat building skills. But I think only, we've been doing the program for 20 years, maybe two people have gone on to careers in the maritime industry and that's totally fine. That's not our goal with the program. <laughs> Um, but it does, you know, get people connected to the museum and uh, Lake Champlain has a really robust maritime community, right? There were people have boats, they love boats. Uh, there are less boat builders in our region than there used to be, but we still have um, a fair number of them and they're very talented. We, uh, it is challenging mm. <laughs> to find staff who both have that um, boatiness, as we jokingly call it, the boaty skills, but yeah. then also the um, education museum collections experience and so it's a bit of a unicorn if you find someone who has all of those things and you just try to hold on to them <laughs> yeah i know one of the other things we wanted to talk about was uh relevancy in the community and um i years ago i, I worked for a fire museum we took care of historic fire engines dating back from we had 18th century pumpers all the way to um 1960s fire engines. Uh, we had some fine uh, fire art, fine art and this sort of thing too, but um, kind of communicating the, the relevancy of really niche um, uh, exhibits and collections that can that can be a challenge. Can you can you speak to some of you know the work that you're trying to do uh, with relevancy and community outreach? Yeah, definitely. That's one of the big drivers for us, especially this year, as we all try to recover from COVID. Yeah. So, you know, we are a history, ecology, and archaeology museum, right? So we can tell the ecology story of things that are happening now uh, with clean water. We also have a team of archaeologists who is doing active research and underwater archaeology and preservation work. Uh, and then the history piece, there is an amazing history in Lake Champlain that I think has a lot of relevance to today because we have seen, you know, it's the whole history, history is rhyming kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, Lake Champlain is, are both the New York and Vermont sides of Lake Champlain are no different from the rest of a lot of areas, but we had different waves of immigration and different responses to people who were immigrating to our area. Uh, and we're trying to also now focus on more untold stories. Mm. Um, I think kind of traditionally maritime history is often seen as you know, glorious white men at the helm of ships. Moby Dick. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and right. that's, you know, all interesting stuff, but there's a lot more than that. Yeah. So last year we did an exhibit called Women at the Helm, where we looked at female leadership in the Champlain Valley over time. Hmm. There were some amazing ships captains who have worked and continue to work on Lake Champlain throughout the years. Uh, there was a woman who ran a ferry by herself in 1803 in Vermont, wow. crossing to New York. Um, and, you know, all those amazing stories like that and uh this year we're doing a new exhibit on prohibition in the champlain valley and you know when you again like i think what what i like to do and what i think works really well is you take a topic that people think they know something about <laughs> like prohibition right you think about gangsters and tommy guns and fancy cars right <laughs> um, but then you complicate that by talking more about how we got to that point and what that tells us about today so prohibition is just like an amazing story of government um, regulation, individual action, community politics, and um, law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And it, ha it was going on for a hundred years before we ha got to federal prohibition. So we'll be telling that story um, in a, through a larger lens of looking at 
temp the temperance movement in the 19th century, what happened during federal prohibition, and then bringing that up to today about, you know, why is it that, oh God, Pennsylvania, don't get me started on your liquor laws, but like, why is it that you, it's different, <laughs> a different way to buy beer in every state. Right. And that's actually because of prohibition. Um, why were women the ones being uh, arrested in 19th century Vermont for selling homemade alcohol from their boarding houses. Like, well, that's, there's lots of reasons around mm. that that still resonate today. So I think that is a very long winded way to say that we're trying to make our historical work more relevant by drawing out some of those um, topics that people are interested in. Mm. I like to think that um, there is, there's three parts to a really good museum experience, right? There's what the museum is presenting there's what the audience walks in with already that like the museum can't control. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. what they walk in with. And then there's like this third thing that happens when those two come together. So that, that mush of like what the museum is presenting and what the audience brings, like something happens there. Mm -hmm. And that's where the goodness of museums comes <laughs> is that that's where the learning happens and the new discoveries happen when those two things meet at a museum. Yeah. Getting that, that alchemy um, is, I've had experiences where um, the former happens so much where the museum is is desperately trying to ed educate me and, and get me to learn a certain thing that for the first few minutes I feel inspired and wow, that's kind of neat. But then what happens is I end up fidgeting. I want to, you know, I, I do the, the random, just go random to one exhibit board to the next, I half read things. If it's a if it's a tour, I'm I'm worried about you know getting out of the tour because of whatever parking or because I'm I'm tired of hearing the person go on and on and on. That is a really um, it's that's it's a big challenge to get that that alchemy the way that you want and to get it get that whatever that is that you're talking about <laughs> um, the click. Um, yeah. And I guess uh, uh, training is really important in that, right? And how how we train how we train our volunteers and staff and ourselves on how to en engage with people. Yeah. Yeah. And this year we're also looking at that community piece in a new way too, because we are um, we have got actually gotten rid of museum admission <laughs> charges, so we're not charging admission this year, and mm. we've moved all of our summer camp programs to a pay what you can model, so wow. people are paying what they can. Partially, this is, uh, you know, it's in response to COVID, right? We want, we know people have really suffered and we want to provide opportunities for them to connect. We also, we were closed last year. Um, the museum is only open from May to October. We do programs year round, but we are seasonal. And we just weren't able to be open last year. We did open up on Labor Day weekend uh, and we just were free. It was like three days, come on down. And we heard from a lot of people who said, you know, I live a mile down the road. I've never been here before, but I saw that it was free. So I like came with my three kids and all of the staff that were there that weekend kind of had these moments of like, what are we doing? Why are we preventing people who from connecting to like their own history and their own community for like 15 bucks? Like that's, yeah. that's nuts. <laughs> like, so this is, you know, it's a, calculated experiment, but one that we all feel really good about that we'll just not charge admission this year and see how that affects our visitation. Yeah. Hopefully it'll get more people to come out and, you know, just use the museum a little differently. It doesn't have to be an all day experience. It can just be like, come look at one thing, look at the water, bring a picnic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I've understood, I've I really, I've appreciated the struggle that museums have had, especially when the admission price points are, are higher, you know, 20 30 40 dollars and it's like oh yeah we might cut out you could potentially be cutting out a big chunk of your of your in, income um but like you said if you're if you're at the 20 or less 15 15 or 10 less i mean it's almost like that that goodwill and outreach that you're projecting into the community i mean you would you think that comes back, that'll come back to you in other ways, whether it's someone that says, wow, that's good on them. Here's an extra whatever, get end of year gift or a grant because you've made that decision. I mean, you might end up having a little bit more income come in because of a decision like that. Yeah, that would be, you know, we're, we're hoping that's the, <laughs> a potential outcome. And we've all felt good about doing the right thing. 
And yeah. I think that's what this year has taught us, at least our team. We've, we've been talking a lot about like, why does a maritime museum in a, the end of a dead end road exist? And like, what is the point of all of this? Yeah. Um, and we know, you know, we're all connected. Everybody who works there is really connected to the lake and the water and the history, but we've had some great conversations about how do you turn around and take our passion for it and make it something that's accessible to everyone uh, so that we're bringing our excitement for this to a, we're sparking that excitement in other people. Yeah. Partially, you know, we just like the gloves are off, right? Like there's no playbook anymore. COVID has totally changed museums. Let's just like make it the way we like make it in the image we want it to be. Right. And just see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. I think that 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 courage and that just willingness to take the gloves off and 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 do something different. Um, I think that that that's crucial. I mean, it's it, it's got to be it it has to happen. Otherwise, we our institutions will just sort of just limp along, and um, unfortunately, you see that you see that happening. Um, so. Is there anything you want to, uh, before our lightning rounds, anything you want to uh, plug or uh, anything you want to share in terms of um, any, any words of advice or any, anything for particularly for people uh, pursuing working in a maritime museum? <laughs> oh. uh, so I guess, well, I guess a plug is you should, we've spent a lot of time this year creating a digital museum so that people don't even have to come to our beautiful dead end road that is worth a visit. <laughs> <laughs> which you should come to, but I'll definitely um, put links. In okay, the, great. Yeah. <laughs> so there's that plug. Um, I think I, I love talking to students and museum students and people who are thinking about museums for careers. And um, I think people often like expect there to be one clear like story of like, how do you get from point A to point Z on your museum career path? And that never is the case. <laughs> and um, I- Sometimes you got to brew beer for a little while. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I really just believe in like taking the next opportunity that's offered. Like if there's an opportunity that seems like a good opportunity, like just do it. Even if it doesn't seem like the perfect fit or the most logical thing, if it's there, <laughs> that's a, there's something, I, this sounds so cheesy, but like something will happen. Right. So like if there's an opportunity there and feels like a good fit, just, it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to exist. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think that um, sometimes uh, emerging museum professionals, and I, I put myself, you know, back, way, going way back, I was a little bit like this. You know, I heard stories of my uncle and my grandpa and, you know, aunts and uncles where they got their degree and then they determined what city they wanted to live in. And then they, you know, then they sent in their whatever and they went to a recruiting place and they were offered three positions and then they worked for a place for whatever, 30 some years and got there. You know, it's just, I don't know if it works that way, you know, in any profession nowadays, but especially in museums, you gotta be willing to zigzag along and, and, and get into situations where maybe you just feel a little bit uncomfortable for a little while and, and get, get, then get back in a, in a comfy position. And so, I will say that is does not mean that museum folks should not fight for what they're worth. I think exactly. there is really exciting things happening around unionizing museum staff and people talking about like the severely underpaid profession and you right. know talking about some of the statistics about why are you know so many such a high percentage of museum staff women but such a high percentage of museum directors are men. Right. The New England Museums Association released a report last year saying that male directors in in museums in New England make twice as much as female directors. Mm, <laughs> so wow. there's these glaring inequities um, and gaps between genders, race, all of the ways that museum staff are treated that I think are, there are people working really hard to upend those. And I think that people at the executive level also need to be working really hard to upend that um, because that'll be better, not only for people as individuals, but it'll be good for the whole field of museums. Yeah. Susan, we probably could have talked another hour about sal salary issues and yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness, and and uh, fighting for 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 the salaries that that are deserving and um, but alas, we don't have another hour. You <laughs> that's got season. That's season two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you ready for the lightning round? I am. All right. 
Um, I'm going to save the hard one for last. Um, okay. and, uh, <laughs> so you have to choose. Um, you want to be in a sailboat or a kayak? Kayak. Yeah. And I actually you, don't know how to sail. What if you could sail with someone? Is it still? Uh, I think I'd still go kayak. You can yeah. go to like smaller places and you have a little more yeah. freedom. The Plus there's a really great kids book that my toddler loves called Yak and New. And Yak has a kayak and New has a canoe, which we've been reading a lot of. So kayaks <laughs> are very top of mind for me. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, you have, uh, you, you're at a fair and you have to choose um, cotton candy or funnel cake. Oh. Wow, that's surprisingly challenging. <laughs> I think I would go cotton candy. I have a pretty intense sweet tooth, although they're both kind of desserty. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think I would go cotton candy. Less risk. Funnel cake, a good funnel cake, amazing. A bad funnel cake, so terrible. Right. So less risk with cotton candy. Like, and has a cotton, cotton candy uh, cone ever been returned to the... <laughs> exactly. Like they're always the same. That's the thing about cotton candy. <laughs> this isn't and actually, quite, in a you know... total like weird aside, I used to work at a theater in college and we, <laughs> one of the, we were doing state fair, the musical state fair for the summer. And um, one of, I was like the office admin manager and um, we actually got a cotton candy machine for the, for the um, food vendors. And I, one of my many jobs was making cotton candy at the intermission, which I totally forgot about until right now. So. The little machine. Right yeah, I'm just gonna swirl it around. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so you get to go back in time. All right, okay, let me say, you, you, you see Hamilton live or you go back in time and see jesus christ superstar with the original andrew lloyd weber music <laughs> uh i think i would pick hamilton okay. but like early hamilton like previews oh okay. you know what i would go back to i'm gonna totally mix this up and all right actually all right. nerd it out but um so lin-manuel miranda previewed one of the songs at a dinner at the white house to um michelle and barack obama so i would pick that I would go to that dinner because then I would be there with the Obamas and seeing Lin-Manuel Miranda perform songs that he was concepting for the musical. Wow. Yeah. Be a, that'd be a, a pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> also, I will say, um, didn't think that Hamilton would be such a big hit with a two-year-old, but I have listened to it like hundreds and hundreds of times in the past year. My toddler really loves it. There's and now a... he knows all the words. So it's funny to see a toddler say he's not, give, not throwing away his shot. Is there a, there's a Netflix or Amazon version of it, right? Or it's yeah, on it's on there. Disney Plus. <laughs> it's oh, the, okay. uh, yep, we've watched that too. <laughs> okay. um, so, yes. Yeah, I haven't seen it yet, but um, well, this is, I hope you've had fun. Yeah, this is great. Thank you. This is a great conversation and fun way to just think about the work that I'm doing and feel ready to dive back into budget projections because it's good to remember why I'm doing all those budget projections. And it's because of these topics that we're talking about and helping to make them happen. That's right. The budget is just a sort of a mirror image of, of the mission, right? Yeah. 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 So Susan, thanks again for your time and um, I uh, best of luck with everything. Thank you. Hope to, it, once we can all travel, we'd love to have you up in Vermont this summer to visit the museum. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, we'll, we open May 22nd. So okay. thanks so much for having me, Jason. Take care. Okay. Bye. Bye.